Please allow me to invite our esteemed speakers and moderator to take their seats on stage. Your speakers for this very interesting topic are Mr. Brian Chiu, representative of Registered Digital Markets Malaysia, Mr. Satya Kumar, CEO and founder of Tycoon Plus Advisors, Ms. Jenna Kui Ching, FinTech Division, Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, Mr. Nick Omar Hashida Yusof, former Executive Director, Malaysia Market and Supervision, Securities Commission, Malaysia, and your moderator for this session will be Mr. Clarence Chan, Associate Director of Price Hotels, Coopers, and Risk Services in Ladies and gentlemen, your speakers and moderator. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, very good morning to Dr. Yusli, uh, Dr. Zaitong, as well as Dr. No uh, Thank you for the panelists for joining us this morning as well. Um, maybe just a quick introduction uh, on the panelists as well as myself. I'm Clarence uh, from Philip uh, uh, Steen, Malaysia. On my left, we have Inchik Nick. Uh, yeah, so I was actually contemplating whether I should. I think Inchit Nick Mohamed uh, Hasiuddin, everyone knows him, the former ED of uh, markets and uh, supervisions for uh, Securities Commissions of Malaysia. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Satya Kumar, uh, the CEO and founder from the um, uh, uh, founder for, of the uh, Tycoon Plus and Advisors. Uh, and then we have Mr. Brian Cho, um, the uh, representative from the Registered Digital Markets of Malaysia. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of uh, the Registered Digital Markets of Malaysia, it's actually the association that represents registered equity crop funding and peer-to-peer -peer lending operators in Malaysia. And the last we have Jenna from MDEC, Malaysia Digital Economy Corporations. So very warm uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I know the topic so this morning is about digital economy, is about how accountants like us um, can survive and what we need to do uh, to survive and embrace the upcoming technologies and the trends. Um, I'm very happy that you know we have experts actually over here to share with us this morning, uh, you know, to give us some insights and inputs as well on what we can do. Maybe starting off with uh, Inchin Nick yourself. How do you see accountants generally uh, are in Malaysia in terms of embracing new technologies, new trends? Um, you know, with you know the big buzzwords as well as you know uh, terms like artificial intelligence, uh, like you know equity crop funding, digital financing. Um, what do you have in mind in terms of you know uh, Malaysians accountants in general? Are they adopting, coping well? The mic doesn't seem to work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Clarence. Uh, I'm sure when I was introduced, I was the only former person. Uh, you know, the rest are basically uh, doing uh, a lot of things. Uh, I just sit back at home and post a lot of stuff on Facebook. So if you like uh, what I say today, you can follow me on Facebook as well. Um, just uh, to share a bit about my previous life and to show uh, how much uh, we are being driven by uh, technology. I was as what was introduced, a director in charge of uh, market and corporate supervision. So basically, 
uh, in SC, we look at you know how uh, market meaning you know the trading at on, on bursa are being traded as well as corporate conduct, and and uh, to make sure that you know people can trade uh, fairly, you know nobody uh, abuse the market or uses. Uh, uh, information which are supposed to be shared in taking advantage of uh, of, uh, of, of, of the trading position. Uh, at the same time, we look at uh, companies, make sure that they, they do not uh, breach the law, they perform and uh, share information and public information so that people can make uh, informed business decisions. So it sounded very old school, very boring. But the day-to-day -day operation is basically premised on technology. Uh, we download data from Bursa on a daily basis. We look at trends, we look at patterns, we look at uh, uh, you know, uh, incidences where market could be uh, rigged or there could be syndicates trying to influence prices up or down. And, and it's highly, um, no, we have to rely highly on technology. So even as an accountant who started uh, having you know, my, my professional career in an audit firm, uh, I had to upscale myself to deal with all this sophistication. And I tell you, regulators, while they sound very boring, but there's a lot of innovation that are happening in those closed walls of the regulatory sphere. And, and in fact, regulators are one of the key hirers of accountants. You look at the Securities Commission, the chairman is an accountant. You look across to Abraham uh, Nagara, the, the governor is an accountant. And, 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 and we are everywhere. So not only uh, we are the custodian of information, and we have to ensure information is reported truthfully, especially financial information, but we are involved in the whole ecosystem that provides this assurance to people who are walking on the street, making a lot of decisions, to, so that they can do that in an environment that is very healthy. So technology is very important. Uh, and, and every year uh, in, in my last job, we were dealing with uh, you know, how to deal with continuous evolution of technology. And one of the areas that I dealt with before I left the Securities Commission was to approve the new uh, so-called registered market. You know, regulator, they always use uh, boring words, registered market operator, which is actually uh, the other name for equity crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, financing platforms. So I was involved not just in terms of uh, understanding uh, what the behavior is going to be, uh, how do uh, these uh, platforms help entrepreneurs to raise funds, but we looked at what could be the possible risk and, and how to deal with that. Not, not just about risk in terms of uh, uh, conduct, but in terms of technology as well. That's why I think Brian can testify when this uh, platform was approved, there's a long list of things that relates to technology as well. And that helped me also to do my work now because, for example, now I sit as a board of director of Bank Islam, my chairman of audit committee just left the room. Uh, and, 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 you know, a bank now is principally a business built on technological platform. That's why now you do have banks without branches. You know, people can just interact and transact with the banks using, you know, uh, uh, oh, interfaces that do not require a human being to appear. But behind those things are people who are planning, who are strategizing, who are ensuring that things do not go wrong, all right? So, uh, in summary, as a professional accountant, I think we have to remember, you know, we are professional because we make a pledge to the society that we will continue to update our knowledge, we will continue to enhance our skills so that it will meet our employers or our customers or stakeholders' expectation. But more importantly, you can ask this to Tansri Sama after this, we also commit ourselves to behave in the best the possible way to serve public interest. That will not change. The knowledge will change, the technology will change, the skill will change, but that promise to uphold professional standards, to call a spade a spade, will remain 
plus x. So while we get excited about evolution and all those things, we have to also remember one of our core aspect, one of the core expectation of the counter is to continue to conduct ourselves in the best interest of the society. Well, thanks for watching, Chibong. I like the, the point that you mentioned that you know it's all about core values. The core values doesn't change, right? Um, but on the underlying platform, the technology changes which we need to embrace. I mean, since we are on the topic about equity crowdfunding and P2P, I'd like to actually uh, probably direct the question to uh, uh, Brian yourself. I mean, we, we know that Securities Commission has recently released a framework that's specifically targeting on uh, equity crowdfunding, P2P as well talking about you know digital financing. Um, Brian, do you have anything that you want to share? Okay, um, I would like to think that um, one of the reasons why the platform got the license is because I was an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I dealt a lot with uh, Inchik uh, in the Securities Commission uh, uh, when, when you first started, when you first moved the idea you know, of, uh, of, of doing a uh, crowdfunding platform and obviously at the time you know it was very new and you know we, we had a lot of dialogues and discussions uh, with SC and uh, I, I really want to commend uh, SC you know for having this uh, foresight um, of uh, introducing something innovative right because usually our perception about regulators that um, you know they are rigid they are slow um, you know they are, they are not thinking out of the box you know that kind of thing uh, but in this in this aspect, I think it clearly shows, you know, that um, as far as fintech uh, is concerned, you like the, the term, um, you know, SC has actually paved the way, um, not just in this country but a lot of countries in ASEAN as well. Um, in fact, last week I attended a, a event which is organised by SME Corp, and they invited various countries, including Singapore, yeah, Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia, Philippines. There were representatives from all these countries. Um, who came to listen, you know, to our experience in running an uh, agri crowdfunding platform, right? So, um, back, back, sorry, back, back to your question. Um, I think there is a funding gap. I think that's, that's, the, that's the whole reason why this crowdfunding platform came about was we recognized that there was a funding gap in startups and SMEs, right? Uh, trying to raise funds for a company that's less than one year old or even two to three years old with no profit track record, maybe some revenue, but no profit track record, it is very difficult and very challenging in, in the market. Uh, in spite of, you know, we have so many banks, we have VCs, but it is still a big challenge. So therefore, there is this um, financing gap that um, uh, I guess the authorities or the regulators saw. So therefore, um, you know, they took, they took the first step, you know, of um, introducing guidelines uh, to govern this crowdfunding platform. Now, if you, if you think about it, crowdfunding itself, it is not a new thing, right? If, if you're an entrepreneur here today, um, just think about when you first started your business or when you want to start your business, who did you raise funds from if you didn't have enough money, right? It's actually your friends and family, am I right? Yeah, Pe people that you know of. That is actually a form of crowdfunding, although it's not put in a formal way, but you are actually raising funds from the crowd, but from people that you know. So crowdfunding is basically opening up that, that pool of people from people that you know to people that you don't know and from people that is within your vicinity to people that is outside your vicinity which is overseas, in fact, global, right? So when the platform goes, or when the company goes live on the platform, basically it's open up to the whole wide world. So someone from Russia will actually look at the company and say, hey, you know, I like what you're doing, you know, I like your app, I, I, I want to be part of it and that person could actually invest in the company. So effectively you have a foreign shareholder, a private company having a foreign shareholder. Now, five, ten years ago, you think about it, it is impossible, but now it's made uh, possible. So how do accountants play a role in, in all this? Um, when I was running the platform, you know, I evaluated a lot of companies. Um, so my accounting skills came into play, you know, even though I never spent a lot of years you know, being an accountant, even though I studied accounting, um, you know, but somehow you know, I, um, I, I didn't fit into the mold of accountant, obviously. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, uh, do a lot more, I guess, fancy stuff, right? Right or wrong, but yeah. Um, the accounting skills came into play, you know, because when I evaluate companies, I'm talking about startups and SMEs, um, I need to understand the financials, right? 
And today you see that there's a lot of fintech companies um, that they have a lot of digital experts, right? So they come up with fancy ideas on how uh, they can revolutionize, let's say, payment, uh, cybersecurity, whatever. Um, but fundamentally, you know, when you assess a company, you still need to look at the financials. And therefore, um, a lot of fintechs and startups, they lack that, they lack that, they lack that uh, financial expertise. So um, when I operated the platform, I had, I had that expertise to offer to the platform. And therefore, when it comes to assessment of companies, it made it easier. And when I pitch or when I share the company to potential investors, um, I could bring out this financial aspect clearer you know, than um, I guess those who did not have you know, that financial expertise. So accountants do play a very important role. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is, Yes, we are in this digital economy, but it doesn't mean that you should be left behind. In fact, you have the skills to stay in front. So the question is, you know, whether we want to uh, put in more efforts, whether we want to take the initiative to stay in front. So as accountants, yes, we play an important role, and we can play an important role in this whole uh, digital economy. Well, thank you, Brian. That is very, very inspiring. So accountant actually plays a very important role in the digital economy, uh, talking about fintech is not just about, it appears that it's not just about you know, digital uh, warriors, but also the warrior behind, which is you know, managing the financing, accounting, and uh, you know, the, uh, the used to be boring stuff, but it's crucial and it's important and it's essential. I mean, I'd like to probably get uh, Jenna's view as well, especially you know, in your, um, in your uh, especially you're working in the fintech divisions of uh, MDAC. Have you come across a lot of accountants who are supporting, uh, you know, some of these digital warriors, some of these uh, fintech companies, or are you seeing a lacking of actually involvement from, uh, you know, the uh, uh, accountants who are helping this industry? Um, I think just to clarify, uh, how do we define uh, fintech? So some people actually use tech fin as well. So fintech is actually what they define financial technology supplementing and boosting financial services. On the other hand, TechFin, you can look at technology companies. So you may have heard that Facebook in Australia have actually launched their payment services. So these technology companies are entering into financial arena. So these are the two categories that we actually define it. And yes, my division is actually newly created in Malaysia Digital Economic Corporation. So I was pleasantly surprised on the topic when we were invited and it's actually the same as our Digital Economic Corporation name. Um, when we evaluated the FinTech ecosystem in Malaysia, it is very, very new. It is also very scary for a lot of people, including the banks, financial institution, and the professionals as well. What is this big thing? Is it going to hamper us as a nation? What are we supposed to do? Our, uh, is our boss, uh, our boss going to send us to training to understand what is this? And on top of that, um, I'm going to clarify again, I'm actually not an accountant, so I'm very, very honored to be part of this symposium, but I'm actually a qualified uh, advocate and solicitor, so I was practicing for a while as a lawyer. So what is this new technology a new industry that us as professionals are stepping into. So I wouldn't say that it is lacking. I would say that we need a lot of awareness when it comes to equity crowdfunding, things like that. And recently, Securities Commission has actually launched a new, uh, I would say, FinTech license called Digital Fund Management. So these are things that are just launched to the world to apply. So I wouldn't go to the spectrum that it is lacking. I think it is more like very encouraging to have the existing strong professionals understanding the new business models that are launched around the world. So it, does, it may not make sense right now that there are certain new models, or oh, what is this equity crowdfunding, or what is this peer-to-peer -peer financing, or what is this digital fund management. It is not that scary actually. We have gone through this. Um, sometimes I explain in public, FinTech is actually a lifestyle. Last time there's no such thing as ATM. And then we learn, oh, you can actually take money from the machine. It's safe. 
Then the next thing, oh, there's cards now. That is all digital. It's linked to your bank account. And now the other interesting wave that we're looking around the world is China. China do not actually use cash anymore. If you have the opportunity to go to China, you actually do not use cash. People look at you one kind. You use your phone to pay. When you go to a taxi, four of you into a cab, and then it's like 134 divided by four. So everyone have to go calculate in your mind or calculator. But you do not do that in maybe US or China. Everything is very digital. So it's very important for professionals like us to understand the new business models, not to be scared. But how does it enhance, how do these business owners take technology and enhance their businesses or revenue stream? So I think there's not much of the lacking part. I think it's more like people who understand fintech to have to embrace and get out there and to invite everyone to understand about fintech or tech fin and then build this ecosystem together. So in the fintech division in MDAC, we were wondering what, were, what are we supposed to do, okay, to be honest. We have never stepped into a very, very high, highly regulated space. This is the first time that we are spe stepping into finance. And we actually speak to Central Bank and Securities Commission very, very closely, wondering should we step in? And to be honest, when we went to meet all the banks, we got a weird look. Why is this digital Malaysia Digital Economic Corporation stepping into fintech? We're a new kid on the block. People gave us a very, very weird look. But embracing the strength that we had all this while, which is developing a digital economy, we deal with investors, we deal with startups, we even bring companies to immersion to other countries, we bring some talents inside as well, we also embrace tech, tech companies to understand their struggles, so things like that. So on our side, what is digital economy is, uh, it's actually four pillars. The first one is driving investment. So be it driving uh, foreign investment or even local investment. The second one is building local tech champions. We want to see big players, big companies scaling out and contributing to the world economy. The third one is building or catalyzing innovative digital ecosystem. And the fourth one is very interesting to us as Malaysians, is digital inclusivity. So these are the four pillars that I think as professionals, as accountants, we have to take note that especially digital inclusivity is very, very close to our heart and I think everyone else. How do we reach out to the very, very interesting B2C market as Malaysia? Because a lot of foreign companies are looking at Malaysia as a very interesting place to expand their businesses in the B2C market or B2B2C market. Where the rural areas, how do we embrace digital? How do they expand their businesses? How do they go online? How do they sell on Instagram? So things like that. So I think it's not about lacking. I think we're at a very, very interesting stage right now where we all can learn from each other and then build the ecosystem and economy together. Right, thank you. So we're definitely not lacking the iron. In fact, we should actually see the glass half full rather than half empty and embrace them. I mean, that's Malaysia in a snapshot. I mean, Safi, I know that you flew all the way from India. Um, I mean, in comparison, I mean, do you want to share, I mean, between India or this region generally, um, how do you see digital trends and, you know, how, is it, how do you see them affecting, you know, accounting profession uh, and professionals like us? I think that's a good question, in fact. If you look at uh, in the past, especially in the seven years uh, down the line, the entire accounting profession is actually taking a different trajectory. The reason is the good old days where we have been uh, accounting in the books of accounts, uh, physical books. Today everything is actually technology. It's an ERP driven. There's a requirement to interact with the cross-functional teams. So when the, the profession is actually taking a turn, it is an immediate requirement that the accountants actually embrace the technology. Because if accountants are not embracing the technology, then they will not be advising on the technology, then they will not be able to audit the technology. So when I say audit the technology, even today the financial statements are generated in the technology perspective. And if you don't understand the audit trial, it is going to be very hard to justify our regulators. So there's an immediate requirement for accountants to embrace the technology, be it an audit, be it a tax function, everything is actually changing out to the technology. In fact, yesterday I was addressing on the BEPS uh, 
issue, that is base erosion and profit shifting. For example, today Malaysia has actually brought in this immediate uh, requirement to bring that country by country reporting. For example, 3 billion uh, uh, RM, I suppose, 3 billion RM companies, turnover companies, has to embrace this country by country reporting, that is master file and local file. This is not a physical file that we need to maintain. It is a technology that is going to help uh, in transforming this requir reporting requirement. That is one thing. Second, now the entire population, the citizens of the country are also moving towards technology. Be it your payments, which is payments bank, which is emerging around the world. Be it your uh, identity cards, which are now digital. For example, MII saw from this year onwards, they are moving towards a digital membership. Now, everybody is embracing digitalization. And accountants who are the pillars of the country, I would say, the partners in the nation building, I would say, should immediately go towards understanding the technology and uh, embracing it. And we are also, some accountants are also very heartening to know that some of the accountants here who are present today here are also advising the government, Securities Commission, to the corporate governance, to the digital economy. So there's an immediate requirement for all the accountants to embrace the technology, understand the latest trends that's happening, very important, because if a technology comes and embracing it, that's one thing. Two, working on the vision of the technology is very, very important. That's how the disruption comes. And, uh, and, and, and all, the, all the regulations are converging. Today, the regulation, the regulatory requirements, the laws are converging towards the technology. Every law is enabled through technology. So when that is a kind of agenda going around, I think we need to embrace it. Coming from the experience of India, today, India, under the Prime Minister Modi's uh, uh, vision, is actually transforming itself into a digital economy. India, they have embraced something called Digital India, where the vision of the government is to ensure that the digitization reaches to the remotest part and the rural villages in the country. In India, we have about 6,60,000 villages where the government wants to connect the technology to the villages. Now, when the village people, when the rural segment, when the uneducated lot are going to embrace the technology, and definitely there is going to be a disruption in the business and commerce also. And it is expected in India in the another five years, 60% of the e-commerce business is going to be from the rural areas. So that's the kind of a vision that the government is working on. That's a kind of a pace at which India is actually transforming. And looking at Malaysia, I think uh, we need to, uh, uh, we, we are, I think Malaysia is more advanced in respect to technology. And it's easy to actually disrupt anything here because population uh, is understandable and you can take a technology with even to the remote, remotest class. And uh, you won't believe, I actually, I am the honorary advisor for the Department of Tribal Welfare in the Government of India. I went to a remotest village in India. There was a group of tribal people. And I was just advising them on the career path for their children and the parents, how do they educate them. One of the tribal lady was taking a photograph of my entire event in that photograph. I asked the tribal lady, what are you going to take, what are you going to do? You are taking the entire photograph of the event. What are you going to do? She said uh, in the local language, she doesn't even understand English. She said, uh, I'm taking the photograph. After going home, she said in English, I will download and then I will print the photograph. We have a printing facility, we have purchased a machine. And then she said, I will upload in the Facebook. That's the kind of a disruption that is going around the world. And when that kind of a disruption is going around, reaching the nook and corner of the rural places and the masses, I think there's an immediate requirement for the accountants to embrace it. And FinTech is a great opportunity because the accountants are the best professionals to understand finance. And when the accountants are the best professionals to understand finance, I think there's an immediate requirement to embrace any kind of technology that is coming in, be it a crowd, uh, crowd, fund, uh, crowd, uh, crowd platform, funding platform, or be it on the security space, be it on the, tech, uh, on the uh, regulatory space, there is an immediate requirement to understand it. Not only that, the accountant should be the evangelist of the digital digitization program of the government to reach to the masses. Very important, because every accountant is an influencer because they deal with the clients, they deal with the government, they deal with the industry. So I think the accountants are the best evangelist of the digital economy around the, around the country. And uh, MIA is having a vision to have 60,000 accountants. I think as the accountants grow more in the country, 
I think they are the best evangelists to actually go and speak about the digitization in the country. And that's how the accountants have to transform themselves to be the advisor for the government, industry, and academia. That's very important. That's my view. All right. Thanks, Sophia. So it looks like, you know, we have a consistent and very common themes here saying that you can't run away from technologies. Um, I mean, digital is here. People are embracing it. I mean, in your opinion, in changing, how do you think, as an accountant, we can do better in upskilling ourselves, uh, make sure that we're prepared when you know uh, all these really hit us uh, uh, hard. Okay, uh, to me, I think it's about how do we reimagine the role that we're playing, because where, where we start is we are the custodian of information, primarily uh, financial information, and uh, now we are talking about other information that can help business to meet their mission and vision, as well as serving the stakeholders. So basically, we are at the forefront, and I think uh, Dr. Yusli did share about why we prefer for accountants to become CEOs, because we understand the language. And, and I think to a certain extent, we also shape the kind of information that goes to the C-suite, as well as the information that goes to the board. So, and, and I think that is very important. Now, what we need to do is, okay, how do we leverage on this uh, position to become more meaningful when things are going to be a bit more uh, uh, disruptive? But, and, and, and at the same time, I think we need to look ahead. While uh, it's quite interesting to, to, listen, to hear about how India is trying to wire uh, the, 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 the villages, but if you step back and look at how things are going to be played out, while you can have a lot of business activity, in the real world, somebody will still have to deliver the stuff. And this is where logistic comes into play. So you have to have that kind of mindset to, to, to be able to shift where are the opportunities. Uh, because, uh, you know, while, while this, this buzzword digital sounds quite fuzzy, uh, there are certain things that will not change, uh, apart from the values that I mentioned. When you talk about connect, uh, e-commerce, for example, I was in a negotiation table with one country, I don't want to mention the country, many, many years ago. I think easily 10 years ago. And when we talk about trade liberalization, they were insisting that they want their courier services to be given full access to Malaysia. And that was like 10 years ago. Now you know why. Because when e-commerce evolved, when e-commerce become the in thing, the critical part of that is the logistics. So this is the kind of mindset that you must have in positioning yourself to be relevant moving forward. At the same time, at the same time, accountants do have this natural tendency to be risk adverse, right? And when we talk about digitization, uh, you know, last few days we have this uh, scary situation where you know you have this uh, ransomware uh, thing that got around. You know, on Sunday night I text my uh, chief operating officer of the bank to say, are we ready for Monday? Because you know, the bank will be exposed. But that shows that there's always the downside of technology, especially on privacy, especially on cyber threats, uh, especially on uh, leakages of information. So we do have that natural tendency of managing risk as well. So, so I think uh, if we leverage on our natural tendency of thinking ahead, looking for potential to innovate and and use that to contribute to the organization while at the same time becoming the so-called uh, experts or person that look at the downside of technology in terms of managing your cyber security, managing your, 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 your whatever potential risk around technology, then I think the road or accountant will remain relevant. So I think uh, we are there in a sweet spot, but it requires a lot of redefinition of the common words that we use. When you talk about control, it's no longer about controlling the physical group. We have to look at control in a wider way. And, and uh, when I was, uh, just to go back to my experience, when I was uh, supervising uh, the capital market, one of the critical entity in the capital market is the stock exchange. And what is critical for a stock exchange? Electricity supply. Because without elasticity, no trending can happen. So one of the role is also to look at how does the stock exchange manages the risk of power failure? 
So they had two, they have two different uh, spire, uh, the power supply from two different grids. They got all the uh, the backup generators. They got so so. I think uh, while while you have the you know potential of going everywhere using digital, they're still interfacing with the real world. So I thought you know that that would be something that you need to have in mind when you look at all these opportunity change, challenge all the, the, the barriers, but at the same time, be mindful of the risk. And I think accountants are at the same spot. Thanks, Sinchen Ling. So it looks like, you know, a business strategies these days is, you know, considerations of many, many aspects, you know, not just on the financing part, but also operationally, you know, whether the business can sustain, any disaster happen, can you actually recover your business? I mean, I'd like to maybe go a little bit uh, backwards and, and then talk about, you know, still, Bread and butter for many businesses are still about financing. I mean, Brian, in your opinion, in terms of you know uh, getting finances for companies, especially small and uh, you know SMEs and the smaller ones, right, who do not have the benefit of actually getting uh, investors, large investors or sophisticated investors, um, in your opinion, uh, you know how can you know, all these uh, activity crowdfunding, P2P lending actually can help them? And currently, I mean, in Malaysia, are we gaining traction? Okay. Uh, first of all, when we first uh, launched this uh, agri-crowd and, uh, and recently B2P, uh, we had to do a lot of education because uh, both from the company's point of view, it's those companies who want to raise funds and then also the investors. The okay, companies, is, uh, they, they do not know how this, this whole thing works, right? Um, the main concern they, they, uh, they, they always pose is, firstly, am I going to have like 100 shareholders or 200 shareholders? And if I, I have that number of shareholders, how am I going to manage these few hundred shareholders? Um, secondly, um, there's no guarantee, right? Because I, I cannot uh, take the capital from the investors and I cannot guarantee you know, that I will pay them back. Um, then, of course, thirdly, um, they, they face this issue of, is this going to work? You know, putting up on a platform, going live, telling the whole white world, hey, I'm raising funds. Um, what if it's not successful, you know? Uh, you know, I'm going to lose face, you know, because um, you, you must understand, uh, crowdfunding has been in US for many years. Um, you, you probably heard of Kickstarter, right? Some of you probably would have bought uh, or invested through Kickstarter, and you probably got some, some fancy products. Um, it works better in US and Europe because there's no face issue. So even if a project goes up live and it fails, it is fine for them, right? Because to them, they look at they look at it very positively. They say, I, I, "I learned right why I failed, and the next time when I put another project up live, um, I can do better, right? And the chance of success is higher." But if you look at Asians, it's different. The mentality is when I go out there, I cannot afford to fail, you know, because I'm going to be so embarrassed, right? So, so we we had to overcome this this um, cultural issue, um, which exists, right? We we are not. Um, disregarding it, we know that it exists, but it's really a question of okay, um, we want to make sure that it's successful, so therefore we have to do this first before we put you up live. It means we have to secure um, uh, some investors first before we put up, we put you up, up live, um, so that the chance of success is much higher, right? So, so we had to overcome some of these cultural issues, we have to overcome uh, um, uh, knowledge issues like how this whole pl platform works. Because for an SME, you know, that's been running a company maybe uh, 10 years and they probably have a business owner that's um, 40, 50 years old, they may not understand, you know, what it means by raising money through a digital platform. They are so used to going to the banks, filling up forms, right, um, pledging their property or pledging their assets and then getting money. But to say that, hey, I'm going to disclose all my information, I'm going to disclose my company on a platform where everybody can see. So this, this, this kind of mindset needed to be changed. Uh, but I'm happy to report that you know over the last uh, 18 months, you know when all the platforms launched, um, since then you know we have put up live 25 companies, right? And out of the 25, 21 issuers, what we call it, um, were successful, right? And they managed to raise funds to a team of 14 million ringgit. Uh, that's over a space of 18 months, right? If you look at the quantum, it may look very small comparatively to a VC funding or a bank, mm -hmm. but remember. It's such a new thing, crowdfunding, right? It is such a new thing, and I think if I speak on behalf of all the operators, we have done, you know, pretty well, right? To be able to 
um, overcome this barrier and now people are starting to warm up to this idea, uh, companies are starting to warm up to this idea of uh, putting their companies on the platform and being able to raise funds, right? So SME startups, when we approach them, we know that they have this financing gap, so we know that they need money, but what is the platform that could enable them to do it? I'm not saying that crowdfunding is the, the antidote or is the uh, uh, solution you know, uh, that, uh, that's not going to fail, uh, but it is an alternative and it is a viable solution um, for companies to raise funds. And this is something that we have been preaching to startups and SMEs, particularly SMEs. Yeah? So I, I'm pretty sure most of the accountants here, because what I understand is a lot of tech companies don't really have accountants, right? Because they, they just run their business as, as they wish. And you know that a lot of tech startups, right? They don't even look at bottom line. They keep focusing on the revenue, 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 right? Getting market share. So that's why they don't really need accountants because they don't need someone to manage the cost. But when you approach SMEs, it's the other way around. Um, Cost is very important, cost needs to be managed. Um, bottom line is important, right? So when, when you, if you are an accountant of SME, you need to understand that this is something that we should be, you, you should be telling your bosses or your CEOs that crowdfunding could be a, a good platform, you know, for your companies to raise funds. If you go to the banks, it gets rejected. You go to institutions, it gets rejected. Why don't you try this crowdfunding platform, right? And why just limit it to tech, tech companies? Tech company seems very sexy, seems very nice, and you know when we hear about the likes of Facebook and all that, hey, you know you wish that you are an investor of those companies, right? But there are a lot of SMEs in Malaysia, right? And I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've so dealt with them. They are really good companies. Okay, they are really good companies, and if you go up on the crowdfunding platform, I can tell you, you know, there will be many investors who will be investing. It means many investors who's going to place their money. And put their money into the company because SMEs, as opposed to tech companies, SMEs are more grounded. They have assets. It's something that you can see, you can feel, you can touch. Uh, tech companies, yes, they have fantastic idea, but a lot has to do with execution. But SMEs, you have a track record. You know that you have this product and service in the market that can be sold, that can be marketed, and therefore, uh, it's it, it's an easier sell, you know, on the crowdfunding platform, right? So the message I want to bring across to your accountants of SMEs do consider um, the platform because it's definitely a viable solution. Right. Thanks, Brian. So it looks like we shouldn't get too uh, engrossed with just you know, the digital, digital, the startups, but also let's not left, uh, leave the SMEs behind because these are the ones who have really built their credentials, reputations over the time. Um, actually, just now I was actually having a chat with Sathya and we talked about regardless of SMEs, regardless of, uh, regardless of uh, big corporates, you know that the adoption of technology is right. Um, there are so many technologies out there, people talk about artificial intelligence, robotics. Are these real? Are these actually going to come in? Uh, I, I, we were talking about, yes, even some of the smaller companies are adopting some of these uh, tools and solutions. Um, I mean, are there any examples in real life or use cases that you have seen that businesses actually have adopted them? Uh, today, the, the buzzword is the robotic and cognitive solution and uh, the future of the jobs. For example, today many people around the world are actually losing jobs. The reason is the advent of the robotics. When I talk about robotics, uh, coming, I'll come back to the SMB and I'll just set the context for the robotics. Don't think that robotic means a physical robot coming and serving in your company. It also means the automated process which are through computers. To put it in a very simple way, to understand what is robotic and cognitive solution, even the Excel macros, the macros function, what you use, is which is automating your process, is also a robotic solution. So that's the kind of understanding you should have when you talk about robotic. It is not a humanoid robot, it is a process-oriented robot, which will actually replace the work. For example, the future of the job is the person who is going to have the critical thinking and design thinking and there is going to be creative element. Only those people are going to have the job. And other jobs are going to be replaced by robots. When I say robots, the automatic, automated processes are going to replace. Now coming back to the challenges and the opportunity for the SMB. Today, the 90% of the employment opportunity around the world is provided by the SMB. There is an immediate requirement for 
embracing the technology to the SMEs because the products of the SMEs are premium, but they don't know how to market it. Provided if they come into the uh, digital space, their market capability will increase, their product will come to limelight. And today, advent of the technology has made people to actually disrupt the market within seconds. If a product is good, and if you're connected in digital platform, if you engage a good marketing, digital marketing company, your, your product is going to be up for sale and you can make millions and millions easily. So there's an immediate requirement to actually the SMEs to be educated. And the second thing, the digital platform should be used for a constructive purpose. Today, a lot of, for example, ransom is a, uh, is a, is a, is a bug or I would say it's a bug or the, the, the disruption which had happened in the past one week around the world, which actually shows the destructive side of the technology. Now, how do we going to educate the people on the constructive side? More and people are going to come into the constructive side and when the market is wide open today and uh, for example, if a product is uh, developed and you know, new innovation comes in a particular country, if it is developed by an SME, it can have a wide reach if a digital platform is used properly and effectively. So how are we going to educate our entrepreneurs? That's very, very important. And I'm sure this can be done by the accountants because if companies incorporated, if a tax filing is done to an uh, entrepreneur by an accountant, Definitely accountants are the best evangelist about the technology. Here is again a challenge or an opportunity for the accountant where the accountant has to learn the technology. That is very, very important. Today when we go around, when I go around the world and I interact with accountants, many of accountants feel their role is only debit and credit. Please believe me, the role of a debit and credit is already gone. Because today you don't prepare, really write a journal entry other than for your exams. Because all the accounting is being done by a technology, you have a SAP platform or Oracle platform, you have an accounting platform, the financial statements are generated automatically, and today uh, the financial reporting standards are complicated, I would say, and who has done that complication? It is accountants, because then only we'll have uh, opportunities on our way. So looking at all these things, uh, I think there's an immediate requirement for us to converse the uh, technology towards law and regulation, and to also evangelize that to the entrepreneurs. Because every accountant is connected to an entrepreneur, every accountant is uh, helping the entrepreneur, so that is the way you can actually be an evangelist, that's what I have been telling, so that the SMEs actually come into the uh, uh, digital platform. And you should also take care of the society, because if a social integration also can happen through a proper technology platform. Today, Facebook is a separate country by itself, so a lot of people are already integrated. So how are we going to use this, all these opportunities coming on our way? Only by understanding, only by working on the vision. The future of the profession is going to be working on the vision. Persons who are going to work on the vision, the person who is going to make that as a mission is going to be successful in the future. So here is the role of a young accountants where they need to embrace this technology, take up this technology to the remotest part of the country also and then evangelize it through all mediums possible so that the country citizen empowered gets empowered. When country citizens gets empowered, automatically scaling up of the SMEs will happen, scaling up of the business will happen, that uh, the, everything will be automated and the government also will get benefited out of this. I think this is the role of the accountant. Uh, it has gone or long back, it has got shifted from the debit and credit. Passing of the examination is just a launch pad. After that, empowering yourself and then reaching out to the people is very, very important as an accountant. And that's what my uh, view is all about. Wow. I mean, audience, uh, if you if you agree with me, uh, that was very inspiring. I mean, that was that was very real. I mean, what I'm hearing from all the experts over here is that you know, um, accountants, the role of an accountant is only getting more and more important, more and more uh, crucial uh, in terms of reinforcing the message around you know accountability, integrity, as well as building trust, right? Um, you know, in the changing world of uh, the businesses. I mean. In the next 10 minutes, I think I'd like to actually open up uh, the uh, questions, Q&A sessions to the crowd. I mean, um, if there's any questions, maybe you can actually uh, raise your hand. Uh, and we have the delegates here to actually pass the mic to you so that you can actually ask some questions to the panelists. Yeah, uh, very good morning to the panelists and uh, to all the members. Um, I just have one question. So I'm just a bit curious uh, because we are talking about embracing the technologies and um, the accountants have to, uh, you know, be built up, uh, equipped with their skills and all. But um, relate, re I'm trying to relate back to the accountants um, in the future. Uh, do you think that uh, the demand for accountants will be growing or will be shrinking? 
with these uh, technology coming forward. Thank you. The role of the accountants will increase, but the role what is presently there will not be there. The role of the accountants will be to actually audit the systems. Today we have the auditing of the financial statements, the number crunching work. I think number crunching work will reduce, get reduced or become minimal. And the role of the accountants will be to develop the systems around because everything is going to be systematized. Now let me bring the experience of India. Today India is actually implementing the GST, that is goods and service tax, which is already there in Malaysia. In fact, uh, I feel privileged here to share that we are taking the experience of Malaysia in implementing the GST. And you know what, in India, the GST is actually enabled through GSTN platform, that is goods and service tax network, that is information technology. Today, the role of the accountant from the, the thinking of taxation itself is embracing the technology. So the future is going to be through the technology. When I, why am I explaining this? The entire profession is actually taking a turn because everything what you think hereafter should be thinking the technology you have to give the solution. And uh, payments bank coming in and all these new technologies coming in, I think the role of the accountant in the future, be it an audit professional, you need to audit the systems. If you are a tax advisor, you should have the knowledge of the development that is happening in the digital economy and digital space because all the litigations are going to happen in the digital space. And you, when you are an advisor, again when you are advising, be it your m and advising, or your tax adv uh, advisory, or be it your IT advisory, everything is going to be revolving around the new technology that is happening. So the amount of uh, new things happening around the world is fast, and the understanding and the knowledge of that should also be fast. That's what the most important thing, the programs conducted by the accounting fraternity, like for example, MIA conducts a lot of program. That's where the professional development, ongoing professional development is very, very important, which will gain importance in the years to come. So training is our most importance. I think in the future, the, the profession is going to take a turn, and the profession is only through the technology, actually. Yeah, I, I just add to that. I think uh, what we should not be confused between mastering the technology, becoming the one that creates the technology, from those who are managing and using technology to achieve the organizational objectives. I think that, that one is very important. Because otherwise, we will have this impression that, oh, for me to be useful in the future, I have to start to learn all sorts of things that even I myself do not know. So what is important is for you to really understand what is your role and how could you leverage on all these things, technology or whatnot, to improve yourself. For example, when I was regulating the market, we were talking about algorithms, you know, because now it's about algorithm competing with other algorithms. So how do I know or what sort of algorithm that I need? Uh, to, to, to be able to be competitive in the market. So that, the, the, the design of that is not me, but I should be able to understand what sort of outcome that I want, and then you get the dentist to do it for you. So, so I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about understanding, uh, you know, what, what really is your role, how can you redefine the role so you become relevant when the landscape has changed, but at the same time, it does not mean that you must you know, when we talk about uh, robotics or about uh, robot advisors, I don't have to become a robot advisor myself, but be able to connect all the dots and become the, uh, the, the, the conductor for things to come. So I think this is very important. So, uh, but it requires you to understand where is the landscape moving to. Uh, I think that that's very important. So if, for example, Ryan is coming up with uh, his uh, equity crowdfunding platform, how do I connect that to SMEs? At the end of the day, as what he mentioned, you still need somebody producing the, your real thing. We we'll still need to eat real food, all right? But the distribution, the marketing can be done electronically, but the connectivity is also important. So I think uh, when we talk about digital economy, uh, there are sectors where it can be disrupted uh, severely, like IT. Uh, they are already uh, thinking about there may not be any more banks in the future which I think would be a very extreme thing, but because bank is basically a digital organization. But when you talk about planting trees, when you talk about mining, uh, uh, you know, whatever minerals that you need for your life, you still do the real thing, but you leverage on technology in making things more efficient, becoming more effective, and by the way, don't mess up the environment so that our children, grandchildren, 
and their grandchildren will still have a wonderful world to live in. So while we talk about money, while we talk about making our life exciting, please remember about the future generation who also wants to have a high quality of life. Good morning to all the panelists. Actually, I have two questions. Because uh, this, uh, what has been mentioned by Brian Chong is that this equity crowdfunding is kind of interesting. So, I wonder how is the model to be like? Is this like uh, equity crowdfunding is the same like this? What we've seen today is that we heard the news like this JJPTR. Is it the same like this? <laughs> and then the next thing is that uh, what do you think of the potential of this cryptocurrency? In this digital financial mm. world, right? Thank you. You want to take it off, right? Because I'm conscious of time. Oh, yeah, right? actually, I'm uh, conscious of time. Yeah, right? but I just yeah. ask, probably just, answer yeah. question one uh, because that's most important now, uh, most relevant now. Uh. No, angry crowdfunding is not a JJPPR. <laughs> okay? Because we don't promise 20% per month, okay? Not just 20%, we don't even promise a return, okay? Because it's a risky investment, and this is what we tell all the investors. That you're putting uh, money into a startup or into a private company, right? So private company versus a public company, obviously, you know, the risk is much higher, right? Because they don't go through the whole due diligence, they don't pay the uh, IDs like a few hundred thousand, uh, you know, to do their due diligence, they don't pay the lawyers a few hundred thousand or accountants a few hundred thousand, right, to do their financial due diligence. They don't do all that, right? We do our due diligence, but it's basic, it's basic due diligence. And why? Because we do not, how can a startup pay a few hundred thousand right, to do a due diligence? It's, it's not going to work. Okay. So we tell the investors, we do a basic due diligence um, and, and you put your, you're putting your money into a risky investment, right? But the information is there on the website and it's up to you. We don't force you, we don't, we, we are not a fund manager, yeah? so we don't collect your funds and then we start investing for all these companies. You decide, it means you look at the company, you like this food delivery company, for example. You know, you like uh, their model and all that, okay, I put in 5,000. So if you lose, you lose 5,000, for example, right? And, and that's that's the reason why SC set the cap for a retail investor, we can only go up to 5,000 per company. So if you lose, you lose 5,000, you lose your whole life savings, right? So I just want to clarify that no, every crop funding is not a get rich quick scheme, right? But if you are having a portfolio, I think it is good, it is good to allocate a certain part of your portfolio, right? Your portfolio of investments, right? Because you may put your money some in FD, uh, some in stocks and all that, right? So it's good to take some part of your portfolio and put into such investment because you will never know that 5,000 investment can be a 50,000, which is not impossible, yeah? You have, you have seen, you have heard some of these tech companies valuation that has increased 10, 24, 100 fold, right? Over a period of three to five years. So um, make a wise decision, read the information and, and invest wisely. Right. Thanks, Brian. Um, on the second question, actually, you can come to me later, maybe you take this offline, because I just actually did, a, I was actually speaking in a conference about cryptocurrency and blockchain yesterday, just yesterday, I can share some insights to you. I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, thanks so much, the panelists. It was very insightful, it was very uh, useful information uh, being shared to the crowd. I hope the crowd enjoyed it as well. Right, thanks so much, Inche Nick. Thanks, uh, Safia, uh, Brian, as well as uh, Jenna. Um, and I think and that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Boric and the panelists, for the informative uh, session. It is now time for the morning tea break and networking session. I see a lot of hungry faces in the crowd. Refreshments will be served in the foyer outside of the ballroom, and we will reconvene at 11. 10 a.m. for session two of the symposium. Up close and personal with Rambo Bahagia Tan Sri Dr. Dr. Abdul Samad Haji Alias, the Chairman of Kobaranan Insurance Deposit Nation, PIDM, and past President of MIA. I would highly recommend that you have your refreshments inside of the ballroom to ensure that we can start our next session on time. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Rambo Hey, 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 hey,